Well, good evening everybody. Jay Kladek here again. Uh, what you see in front of you, remember that review I did of the Cylon Raider about a month ago? Well, as you can see, the model is done. The, the build itself took about a week, and I must say, this is uh, one of the funnest builds I've ever had in a while. Um, and it's also living proof that you do not have to slave away on a model for months and months and months on end to end up with a project that looks eminently satisfying. Uh, for those of you that not, did not see the previous video, this is the brand new Mobius uh, 132 scale Cylon Raider model kit from the original Battlestar Galactica television series. At least the box is classified as 132, there's some debate about that, but more importantly uh, for fans of the original show, this model is actually quote-unquote studio scale. Now, what does studio scale mean? Well, there's no such thing as one set studio scale. What studio scale means is, by definition, it is a model that uh, is equal in size to an original special effects model. Uh, because special effects models are not necessarily built to one specific scale like model kits are. Instead, they uh, they are built to usually specific size, something that can hold and register the detail really nice and can stand up to the rigors of, of filming. I mean, theoretically any model could be uh, shot for motion control, but the best models are usually the ones that are the largest uh, simply because the detail can be read by the camera very well. Um, with smaller models, sometimes light doesn't play off the surfaces quite as well. Looking at the surface of it, I can recognize pieces from certain armor kits. Uh, these two items here look like transmission housings, I think from a uh, 112 scale to me, a Formula One car. And in the back here, Hasegawa Leopold section lighting this back. All kinds of pieces. An armor armor modeler would have a field day trying to recognize all the parts. Um, I would say that a modeler of decent skill could probably get this done in about two to three days. It took me a little longer though, like I said, about a week. Um, reason being is I added this little feature. Ta-da! Lighting kit. Actually, lighting setup, not really a kit so much. I did not use, like, a uh, pre-manufactured kit from anybody else. Instead, what I did was I had some LEDs stashed away for, for other projects, and I decided, well, I know how to solder. I know about voltages and resistances. Why don't I uh, come up with my own lighting system for this kit? And the Cylon Raider is an ideal subject to light, simply because, well, you don't have to worry about any flashers, you don't have to worry about any, um, <clears throat> don't have to worry about any really complex lighting or a lot of fiber optics. Uh, the original Cylon Raiders were rather simply lit. I mean, he had two amber lights in the front, which I think were incandescents, and then of course he had the engine lights in the back, which I believe were uh, done with halogen bulbs. Um, one nice bit though is, unlike uh, many other models from that era, the engine lights on the Cylons actually had kind of like a slightly bluish tint. I don't know if the effects crews did that practically with the lighting, or if that was done in uh, done in post production with the film, the tinted blue, or what? But uh, as a result, cool white, uh, normal super white LEDs, which normally emit like a uh, bluish tone, work pretty perfectly for that. The lights that I used were basically four uh, five millimeter diameter LEDs, and actually the uh, Kit is kind of earmarked for that because these these are the original clear. This is one of the original clear parts right here, and it's got two little sockets on it that uh, looks like five millimeter LEDs could fit in very easily. Um, and then the ones in the front are 
three millimeter LEDs, one here, one here. And uh, again, they're uh, super. They're they're basically super white LEDs. What I did was I uh, dipped them in uh, to me a clear orange to give them the uh, the amber look. That way, I didn't have to worry about uh, wearing any resistors into the circuit. And all it is is the uh, the lighting. All the wiring is uh, hooked to the uh, to the battery packs and the power switch in parallel. Parallel meaning that each LED has one positive and one negative wire going to like a central hub which goes to the battery pack and if you wire them in series that would be me that would mean one LED is hooked to another which is hooked to another the problem with series circuits is one it uh, divides the voltage between the LEDs and two if uh, one of these one of these LEDs was to burn out it would basically kill the power on everything so Parallel is a little better, and because LEDs don't draw that much uh, current, the results are pretty nice. Um, as this is just a floss pick right here that I'm using to activate this power switch that I buried in the louvers right here. And what it is is just a little uh, simple slider switch. I used a uh, small slider switch made by uh, Team Novak for radio control, electronic speed control applications. It was small enough that I was able to bury it in one of the louvers and light enough that I can just uh, stick something stiff in there. I'm just using a dental floss pick to turn it off and on. And as for the battery pack, all it is is two AAA batteries located right here. The uh, the battery tray I got from uh, Mouser Electronics. Uh, you can also get LEDs from them. These particular LEDs that I've got are from another company called uh, Nicktronics, which I believe is merged with somebody else. At the time, they were not necessarily making, but offering some of uh, probably the brightest uh, white super LEDs, super white LEDs that I'd ever seen. So I went ahead and ordered them. Uh, all it is is powered by three volts, and that's really about all you need for a circuit like this. Some would, some might want to power them with nine volts. I mean, yes, you could do that. Uh, would pour a little bit more intensity to it, but uh, three volts is all I've used. And well, how long do these stay lit with these batteries? Well, I took this model to Wonderfest. I put a fresh set of batteries in, turned it on at. Uh, about 9 a.m. Saturday morning and the lights were still going reasonably strong uh, by the time I retrieved the model at like uh, Sunday a little after uh, 5 o'clock so that's over 24 hours and then I even had it had uh, it powered up and lit for a while in my hotel room and uh, it went to like a good 36 possibly even 40 hours without a problem and I still have I still have those original batteries. These ones that I put in for tonight are a little different. Uh, these are a fresher pair, but I mean, heck, 40 hours of power coming from uh, two AAA batteries, only three volts powering these LEDs. That's that's longevity for you. Now I know it is something of a cardinal sin in electronics to uh, mix different compo component sizes together such as LEDs without using resistors to balance the uh, the current between everything but in this way I was able to get away with it um, this is relatively low voltage electronics only three volts powering the whole circuit and well the resistance values of the LEDs are about the same anyway uh, plus, also, they don't really take that much current to light, and, well, uh, if I was doing this with uh, maybe something powered by 12 volts or 9 volts, then I'd probably put some resistors in there, simply because you got a fair amount more current going through there. But at the same time, too, I would only use higher voltage if I was doing something such as flasher circuits or stuff like that. For this, six LEDs, not really... Uh, not really necessary to have to do that. 
Um, in any event though, as you can see, uh, the cockpit section here works great as a battery cover. Uh, I suppose if I wanted to, I probably could have like put in some kind of a cockpit interior. There are a couple of resin ones out there. But, eh, with the studio models, they didn't really have any see-through cockpits. Um, Paragraphics, though, does make a photo etch set, which basically does these louvers where you could look into the cockpit if you looked at it uh, edge-on. But, uh, I kind of look like the looks of it like this without necessarily looking in and seeing a bunch of Raider pilots. So, it worked for my uses. Now, the on the engine lights, I did have to do something a little different from the original uh, kit configuration. Uh, my, my kit has, of course, these two parts with the sockets in it, but I noticed on one of them it had a, uh, a hairline crack, which um, wasn't really cracked all the way through the part, but there was like a hairline crack, almost like a stress fracture in the part, and uh, the problem is when you apply lights to that, it shows up very obvious that there's a crack there. And no amount of disguising I could do to uh, would fix that. I suppose I could have sent off to uh, Mobius for uh, some new parts, but or bought another model. Turns out I did buy another model, but uh, I'm using that for another project. Instead, what I decided to do was uh, press on and uh, actually come up with a little different arrangement for the lights. So my clear plastic it came from a old CD jewel case and all I did was I took a took my Dremel with a cutoff wheel and just cut out two new panels using the original kit parts as a sizing guide. Trimmed those down, sanded them on both sides and glued them in. Uh, for the mounting ports for the bulbs, what I did was I used a couple of uh, SD's PNC 60 nose cones, which I cut in half. I was originally going to use the cone, but it uh, turns out the back part was a little bit smaller diameter, the part that goes inside the body tube of a rocket. turns out it was a small enough diameter to actually slot into there really nice once I used my Dremel to cut the plastic walls that these clear parts mount to out and I painted the inside of those silver they had a nice little hole in the back I made a uh, little plate out of styrene glued two LEDs to each plate and then glued them to the back the the uh, the nose cone section I sprayed silver on the inside which helps uh, contribute to the silver blue coloring uh, con contributes to the bluish white coloring and basically it acts like a flashlight housing as a result the LEDs are uh, further away from the uh, from the frosted plastic or glass as it were the light diffuse is really nice. You can't even really tell that there's two LEDs in there. I probably could have done this with uh, just one LED in each area, but two made it nice and bright. And, well, produced a really nice effect. Let's talk a little about the, uh, the paint job on this model. Um, now, with the with a lot of the models that were built by both ILM and Apogee Studios back in the day, um, usually what they did for painting is they would uh, do the entire model over in a uh, black base coat, and from there they would um, spray it over in in the body color that they wanted to use. Sometimes they would uh, sand the paint to make it a little more transparent to make panels look nice and dark. At least that's what they did on Star Wars. For Galactica, I got the sense that they used a very similar technique. Uh, I used a similar paint technique on this one. After I primered everything over to uh, check for flaws in the construction, I oversprayed the entire model in black. Specifically, I just used 
Tamiya Rattle Can Black, um, Rattle Can Flat Black, because it's a lacquer based paint. It's nice and rock hard, it won't rub off. I masked over where the stripes are here using the uh, using the templates in the kit. Um, did them over in masking tape and made sure to measure everything. The bottom has also got similar striping. Masked those over, uh, sprayed the model overall in uh, Tester's Model Master Light Ghost Gray. Um, instructions said it was like some sort of a pale gray shade. I went with something, light ghost gray is a really good color. It's got a nice slightly bluish hue to it. It's uh, not as bright as light gray and it gave me a really, really nice effect. And to try to maintain a little bit of that pre-shade and get some of that black to pop out, like a wash, um, it's a little light in spots and actually even in some cases a little streaky. Part of that was due to the airbrush I was using and part of that was due to the fact that I was rushing this a bit. Uh, for instance, this wing in comparison to the wing on the other side, this wing is noticeably a little darker. There's a couple areas where I did paint over the panels in a slightly lighter shade and then I even dry brushed over to give a good contrast, but all that is basically the uh, the same light ghost gray. Um, the the uh, the pre-shade on the top worked pretty well um, for things such as the these wells right here with a lot of interior detail. Basically I used a uh, a Vallejo dark gray wash to accent some of that. I did some dry brushing. Uh, some of these darker panels here are like a mixture of uh, two Tamiya shades and up with a slightly bluer gray shade. Um, I still need to add it to a couple areas like these little boxes right here on the gunwell should be this shade of gray too. Same same thing for the fronts here. But uh, I ran out of time and took it to Wonderfest and it took a bronze as is so will I add to it? I don't know. But uh, as you can see detail is pretty nice. This piece right here this should also be a darker gray shade just like this, but looks okay. Actually this color right here is uh, Tamiya Light Ghost Gray, which is basically the same color as Model Master Testers, but slightly, slightly different. I mean, if you're really in a pinch and trying to get something done, you can go with that. Uh, in my case, I was debating using the Tamiya shade instead of the testers, but I decided, nah, let's use the testers, let's airbrush it rather than rattle canning it, and well, I'm happy with the results for the most part. Um, paint is a little uneven in spots, but, well, it does look better than most studio models that you're going to find, because studio models, a lot of them tended to be painted very, very quickly. Pastel chalk weathering, I did that to elements of the wing panels here, some of the streaking, and it was just basically done to break up the monotony, because uh, otherwise if you don't do that, people will look at the panels and notice flaws in the paint, but uh, with the pastel chalk it kind of gives a purpose to the uh, to the unevenness on the panel. I mean, I know most Cylon Raiders were cannon fodder, but you got to figure that a lot of them, well, lasted quite a while, and hell, they're flown by machines, they probably don't care for the aesthetics, although they do seem to like uh, really cool insignias. That's just the normal uh, kit decal. It applied really nice, although uh, <clears throat> I did have a problem with uh, one of these images breaking up and I had to use a backup decal from the second kit, but the second kit I'm not going to use the, uh, the kit decals anyway. Um, I've got something in store for that. I'm not saying what exactly right now until, but uh, when I start work on it, I'll uh, shoot some in-progress videos. Let's flip it around to the bottom. Here you can see the uh, work done on the black pinstripes here. There's also a little bit of uh, darker gray accent paneling right here. And the pre-shade does expose the... does help to highlight the the deep shadows 
really nice. Plus the fact that this model is studio scale means that you've already got some deep shadows anyway. Things on the lower part, a couple of mo a couple more of those Hasegawa Leopold tank chassis, part of a part of a gun barrel, probably from a Tiger, maybe 172 scale. Very nicely done detail-wise, I think. This looks like uh, part of the lower suspension from a uh, from a car or a truck model. Um, tank treads galore. Overall, Mobius did a really, really good job with this kit. I've been very, I've been very impressed with what I'm seeing. Um, how's that look? Most impressive. Oh, uh, one thing that I will point out uh, for those of you that are building this model is. Um, there is, there was a little bit of a uh, sink trench on the leading edge right here. I made no, I made no attempt to fill this, but uh, somebody who might be a little bit more anal in their construction might want to put a little bit of filler putty there. What causes that is if you've got like a ridge of uh, plastic on the underside, if if a part gets thick or if it has like a ridge. Uh, what can happen is, is sometimes thicker plastic can cool at a slightly different rate than uh, thinner plastic and it can cause the uh, surface in that thicker area to uh, shrink back slightly. So we're seeing a little bit of that. Um, most every model kit has that to a certain extent. Uh, but just a little light filler putty can take care of that. Um, didn't really have any problem with the, any ejector pin marks, although I do know that there are a couple on the inside of one of the intakes. I didn't really bother with them. But uh, somebody who might want to be putting work into this, like say for an IPMS contest, might want to address those. Wouldn't be a bad idea. And pfft. Another thing as well, the guns, a few modelers are uh, replacing the gun barrels with... Uh, telescoping brass tubing. I could have done that here, but I decided to stick with the stock gun barrels. Although I did uh, drill out the tips with a pin vise just to make them actually look like a barrel and not just look like a flat cutoff right there. Well, here we have the uh, Cylon Raider on its uh, stock Mobius display stand. <laughs> nice and big. Uh, since I didn't have um, very much time before Wonderfest. I just went ahead and used the stock sand sprayed over with uh, black metallic uh, Tamiya paint. And that's about all it needed. I mean, yeah, it has uh, like an embossed earth logo on there, but uh, the embossing is all on the bottom of the stand, not the top. So spray over the top of the surface. It's a nice, clean visual appearance. If I had time, I suppose I probably could have put some sort of logo on there. But this stand at best is only temporary anyway. Uh, with my next project with the Cylon Raider I'm probably going to use a uh, just a trophy display plaque with like three acrylic rods in it just to give this give a model like this a three-point stance. Um, other thing about this one is if you jostle the ship well hey look they're waggling! Yeah looks more like a Dutch roll to me. Once it sells down, though, it does look the part rather nicely. Turning around to the back. <sighs> does look pretty cool. But, uh, well, with the exception of my, some uh, minor touch-up in spots, uh, this model's essentially done. I, I am very happy with how it turned out. Uh, given a little more time, I probably could have made it a little cleaner in spots, but, uh, well, looks better than most uh, studio models that you see, because they were really only painted well enough to get the shot, and not much better than that, and, well, I would like to do one of the Mobius Vipers in my personal collection as well. I've got plans to do a couple of them. Need something to go against this writer. Um... For now, though, this is a pretty good 
the results I achieve with this model are very, very nice. And I think with a bit of work, you could probably achieve something similar. Uh, whether you just want to paint stock or whether you want to do a lighting kit, and like I said, this uh, lighting this lighting project was relatively easy. And only reason why it took so long is just because I had to make some modifications to the back end of the ship. But overcoming that, I definitely like the results. In any event, uh, happy modeling. Uh, hopefully, this will inspire you to work on a uh, similar project and. I can't wait to see what uh, some of some of you other guys are doing video wise. And until my next project. Thank you for watching.